Can you guys hear me okay? In the back? Good, good. Um, I just want to have another uh, thank you applause for um, all the organizers for this event. Great job. <laughs> They're the reason why we're here. And so we were talking last night, and I, I found out that they only spent three months organizing this, this conference. And a lot of other conference organizers will spend 12 months or at least 11 months out of the year getting ready for next year's event. Um, I thought, wow, that's amazing. How did that work out? How, how could you do that? And um, they said, well, you know, we just made it happen in three months. And I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Maybe you didn't stress out so much because you only spent three months working on it rather than stressing the whole year. So with that in mind, uh, I went back to my hotel room. I decided, all right, I'm going to write all my slides tonight. So I threw away all my slides and I wrote them all last night. <laughs> I'm kidding, kidding. Uh, so this is my talk, Hacking with Gems. Um, uh, and like was, all, was already said, this is an actual hacking talk. So I'm not going to be talking about hacking on gems, which is what a lot of people think this is about. It's actually getting credit card info or passwords and things like that. Um, and with that thought, um, I've been considering renaming this talk to how to get rich quick and maybe not go to jail. And you'll see why here in a minute. Um, I've also been told that, uh, by my lawyer that I should read you the following. Uh, ben Smith cannot be held accountable for anything that will happen to you as a result of installing his gems. I also can't be held account accountable for anything that will happen to you as a result of installing anyone else's gems. And I've been giving this talk for a while, so people can have gotten some ideas, uh, and I just be careful. <laughs> Actually, I have a question. Has anyone seen this talk before? I'm just curious. Excellent, excellent. All right, so I want to talk a little bit about who I am before I get started. My name's Ben Smith, um, and in the US, that's a super, super common name, probably one of the most common. Smith is a very, very common last name. Um, I've been told that I should probably use a pseudonym for this talk, so go my, by my elite hacker alias. But in reality, in the States, Ben Smith is already really anonymous. No one can tell who I am. Uh, I've been doing Rails um, for a long time now. I've uh, had the privilege to work with Ruby and Rails since Rails 116, um, and I love it. It's a great community. Uh, I, currently, I'm working at Pivotal Labs, and I live in Colorado, in the United States. So that's a little bit about who I am. But I also want to tell you about what I'm not. I'm not a security expert. At best, I have a fascination in security, but I don't have any training or background. And today, I'm going to be showing you a bunch of these gems. And I want you to keep in mind while I'm showing you, uh, showing you this code, showing you these gems, that they were written by a complete noob, not elite hacker, not a security expert. Anyone can do this stuff. That being said, please don't try this at home. <laughs> please don't take these ideas and write malicious gems of your own. Uh, this talk is a little bit conflicted. On one hand, I'm telling you how not to get hacked. On the other hand, I'm telling you how to do it. So uh, I hope that at the end of this talk, you don't think I'm this guy, you know, a super evil villain. But I don't expect you to think that I'm this guy either. Really, the best that I can hope for is maybe just on the good side of chaotic neutral. So like. Indiana Jones, R2-D2, Mary Poppins? Mary Poppins is actually chaotic good. I had to look this up. <laughs> so anyways, how did all this get started? Well, a, a couple years back, I had a client, and it w I was working on a Rails app for him, and he wanted to know what his dependencies were. He was a little bit nervous about having too many things he didn't know about. Um, so I showed him the gem file.lock, and that satisfies curiosity. But it got me wondering, what's the worst that could happen? What could a malicious gem do? What's the worst possible thing that could happen to my client as a result of requiring a ma malicious gem as a dependency? And Rails has 39 different dependencies. And it's kind of hard to see, but this is the dependency graph of just a plain, brand new Rails app. So what if one of these dependencies was malicious, 
what's the worst that could happen? And I thought that, well, you know, if the user's private data was compromised, um, all the users would lose trust in the product and the client would, you know, fail and go bankrupt. And I thought that's, that's probably the worst thing that could happen. So I thought, how hard would it be to write a gem that did that? And so I went about doing that. And the first thing I decided was that no one would install a gem that was openly malicious. But I might install a gem that claimed to do something useful. It's arguable whether or not this gem is actually useful, but at least it claims to do something other than hack you. Uh, so this gem, awesome Rails flash, message, uh, flash messages, it takes um, your typical Rails flash message and it makes it more awesome. <laughs> All caps, exclamation points and ones, so much better, totally useful. But it has some side effects. So if you dig around the source code, you might notice some odd things like this line. If params to us matches something. If that evaluates to true, then this code is executed. It opens a file called development.log under your public directory and writes all the params to it. And it also posts the params out to a web service somewhere. So if we go back to that if statement, that base64 decode actually translates to password. So anytime the Rails app receives a request that contains the param password, it writes that to that development.log file and posts to a web service. So the development.log file, which is in your public directory, which means I can publicly get it whenever I want, um, has clear texts, emails, and passwords. And of course, elsewhere on the internet, I'm also seeing those same thing. So you, you, you might know this internet meme it usually goes something like this, step one, do something, step two, do something else, step three is always question marks, which always makes it hard to follow these. Never know what to do there. And then step four is profit. Uh, so if I, if I took this and filled this in with some concrete steps, it would look something like this. Step one, write a gem that does something. Okay, got that. Add code to harvest emails and passwords, yep. Use emails and passwords on banking websites to transfer funds, and of course, profit. But there needs to be one more step, or I think there does, at least in this case. Um, and that would be flee the country. People <laughs> tend to not like it when you take their money. And I'm not an expert on this subject, uh, but in the States, um, in the US, um, there aren't extradition laws for 54 different countries in the United States. So if you want to come visit me, I'll probably be in one of these countries. But uh, enough dreaming, let's get back to some Ruby. Uh, so I wrote that first malicious gem, and I thought, well, that was easy, what else can I do? So I wrote another one, um, and I called it an HTTP detector, and what I wanted to do here was detect the hack that I just wrote in my awesome Rails flash message gem. Um, so this logs out calls to net HTTP. So in your you know, Rails log or to um, standard out, you get something like this where it's saying, you know, net HTTP got called with post form and it went out and hit this Heroku app someplace. Uh, it's not pretty, but it shows what's going on at least. If you look at how it works, it uh, defines post form, which logs stuff out. Um, it also uh, defines a valid post form, so if you need to make um, HTTP calls, and you know that it's you know valid and safe, you can do that. But it also does one more thing. So on the last line of one of these source files, we see this line. It's going out to somewhere on the internet, fetching some code and evaluating it. So what code is it evaluating? Well, it's a, a little before filter that looks for a pram called DB console. And if it finds it, it does some active recordy stuff. So if you take your normal Rails route, you know, such as user sign in or anything else, um, and you added a DB console equals something onto it, then you'd get a nice little interface uh, to the database. So now I can do things like show me all your users, make yourself an admin, or even create a database user. Uh, so the moral of this story is careful of wolves in sheep's clothing.
And if we go back to our uh, five-step um, workflow for getting rich, we could write a gem that does something, add code to get database access, and then use personal information that you get out of the database to apply for a boat loan, profit, and of course, flee the country. And then sail your boat to a beach. Um, when I was Googling for the list of countries, or when I was about to, when I was trying to put together this map, um, I sat down and I was at home and I was on my home network and I was logged into Google and I typed in, what countries do not have extradition laws with the US and hit <laughs> enter. And right after I did that, I'm like, ah, I should not have done that. <laughs> now I know I'm on a list someplace of people who are watched. <laughs> Anyways, so I got database access, and I thought once again, oh, that was easy. What else can I do? So I went on to write another gem, better date to us. And all it does is strip some extra white space off of the 2S date formats in Rails. Of course, it's not the only thing it does, and you might notice a theme here. None of these gems only do what they claim to do. So what does it really do? Well, it calls this set date formats for method and passes the Rails environment and the Rails root. Well, that looks a little strange, so let's dig into that code. If we look at the code for that method, this is what you get. And it looks a little strange, uh, and that's because it's a C extension, and it was packaged without the source. Um, it only contains the compiled C code, and you have no way of actually seeing what it does. But I'm nice, so I'll, sh I'll just show you. So if, I, if you took a look at the code before it was compiled, this is what you'd get. Does anyone want to take a guess at what this does? Well, if you run this in your Rails app, in your production environment, you'd end up with something called assets.tar.gz in your public directory. And if I were to go to your site and download that, because it's in your public directory, um, I'd end up with something like this. And if that doesn't look familiar, that's your entire Rails source, source tree. So it's all your intellectual property, all your code. But to be honest, this gem doesn't actually work. This is the one gem that doesn't quite work. Um, these gems that are, are packaged without the source are, are what's known as a fat gem. Um, and there's tools to get them to work, but it's pretty tricky, and I'm pretty lazy. Um, and so after working on this for a couple of hours, I said, Ugh, I'm just going to give up on this. Plus, what am I going to do with your source code? Um, can I sell it to your competitors? Do I sell it to China? It's kind of hard for me to profit from this. So I just said, that, that was actually hard. What else can I do that's easier? So I went back to the drawing board again. And I wrote another gem. Be truthy. How much truth do you think this one will have? So let's look at what it does. The RSpec matchers, um, this is a pet peeve of mine, um, RSpec matchers the should be true doesn't actually assert against true or false, it asserts against truthy and falsy, and that kind of bugs me. So what this does is it fixes that. So true dot should be true should pass. Whereas user.new that should be true should not. User.new that should be truthy, that should pass. But let's look at uh, what it actually does, because that's what's interesting. It actually doesn't do anything. It's just an empty gem. There's no functionality. And maybe it's because, you know, I haven't gotten around to writing the code yet, but probably it's just because I was lazy and I wanted to go straight to the hack. Um, but if there's nothing there, then where, where is the hack? If we take a look at the file tree, it looks OK, nothing out of the ordinary. If we look at the source, looks good. Like I said, there's, there's no code there. That's basically what you get when you generate a brand new gem. So where's the catch? When you install this gem, prints out this little line, building native extensions, this could take a while. And this output is there um, when it's compiling a C extension. Um, 
But if we look at our source tree again, there's no C there. And our spec matchers probably don't need C extensions to run. So let's dig a little bit more. If we look in the gem spec, um, this gem extensions line is usually used for compiling C extension. But in this case, I'm telling it to run the rake file at install time. Now, keep that in mind. The rake file is run at install time, not when you require the gem, not when you execute the code at install time. But there's no rake file here, uh, so where'd it go? Well, if we took a look at this gem source tree before it was installed, um, we'd see something a little bit different. We'd see a rake file and this temp.rb file. So what does the rake file do? This is the rake file that was run at install time, by the way. Well, it copies that temp.rb file to your home directory and hides it as .temp. It then proceeds to add an alias for sudo to your bash profile and points it at that new .temp file. And then it removes itself. So the rake file just removes itself. So there's no evidence left behind that anything happened. Um, the only evidence left behind was that one line from the gem installer bundle command saying building native extension, this could take a while. Um, but so uh, you noticed I alias sudo to do something else. So what does it do? Well, it kind of does what sudo normally does. Prints out a warning, grabs a password, and then runs the command that you want to run with the normal sudo. Of course, it grabs your password, so it can do a lot more, and it does. It enables SSH. It creates the user and sets their password. And then it tells some web service out on the internet that there's a box that's ready to be SSH'd into. So now guess what I can do? Now I own your box. So what's the takeaway here? <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> I, 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 so I presented some of these gems for the first time as a lightning talk um, a little over a year ago. And this was the biggest takeaway for people. People are coming up to me and saying, I'm never going to install any of your gems. I don't care. <laughs> um, and even recently, I, I wrote a gem that was actually, it wasn't malicious at all, and I needed people to test it. And so I posted on Twitter, hey, could someone try testing this gem for me, see if it works? And this is the response I get. The only place I would install your gem is in a VM, <laughs> which kind of sounds like a challenge to me, but that's another thing. <laughs> So the question is, how can I get you to install my gems? You guys are smart. You'll only install gems you trust. And now, now that I've told you all this, you're not going to install any of my gems. But what gems are trustworthy? Rails, is Rails trustworthy? Yeah. Our spec, sure. Sinatra seems like a safe bet. Um, you have to also trust all their dependencies, but it seems like that's uh, safe. So how can I add some of my malicious code to some already trusted gems? I don't think it's going to be as simple as you know, submitting a pull request. But with this, with this in mind, let's go back to my btruthy gem. So I added one last thing to my btruthy gem. At install time, it grabs your gem cover credentials and your list of installed gems and posts that to a web service. So now I own your gems. And hopefully you guys wrote trustworthy gems, because the next thing I'm going to do is clone your repo, add my own malicious code, build your gem, and then push it up to Ruby gems. And the kicker is you won't even know. Uh, unless you go to Ruby gems and check the version that's currently on rubygems.org, there's no email notification or anything else that lets you know that someone has been pushing new versions of your gem. And I was able to do all of that just by grabbing your little gem cutter credentials key in the publicly accessible gem credentials file. That was all I had to do. So do people trust your gems? And do people 
who install your gems have trustworthy gems, and so on and so forth. It becomes viral at that point. And you start to wonder how many steps of indirection I need to get to one of the dependencies of Rails. But there's still one problem. How do, I, how do I bootstrap this process? How do I get the first set of people to install my gems? My friends won't install my gems anymore. Um, anyone who knows me won't install my gems anymore. Um, so what can I do? Uh, I tried being popular. Um, I wrote this gem social experiment. I pushed it up, and I wrote a script that kept downloading it over and over again. It kept it on the most downloaded day of rubygems.org. But I only got one download out of it, one real download. Uh, that, as well as the, the leaderboard on rubygems.org, doesn't exist anymore, so that just doesn't work. So how else can I get people to install my gems? Conferences. Like right here, this is great. Um, conferences are a great word to get the word out about uh, a new gem you wrote, a new library you wrote. Um, and you'll probably hear about several today. And you can probably trust all of them. I'm not saying you can't. But um, giving a talk is hard, though. Um, there, there must be an easier way. Uh, so I came up with this idea. I came up with a, an idea on how I could get people at conferences to install my gems without actually having to get on stage and give a talk. And this is what I did. I went to several conferences, and in this case, Aloha RubyConf. And I wrote a gem, and I named it after the conference, Aloha RubyConf. And then I created these professional-looking business cards um, to advertise them. And I stole all of the fonts, the colors, the icons from the website, made it look really good. This is the one from Ancient City Ruby that I did as well. Uh, I went around the conference, and I'd leave these cards in little stacks on the tables, like by the drinks, by the food, here and there. I wouldn't actually hand them out to people. I was always too nervous to do that. But I'd just leave them kind of in places where people would walk by, people would see them, pick them up. On the back of the card, it has examples of how to use it. So you can print out the schedule, you can print out all the parties, and sometimes I do like a raffle or a drawing or something like that. Here's the one from Ruby Nation last week. And so when people install the gem at install time, it pings back to one of my servers um, with a who am I. So I can gather usernames of all the installers of my gems. Um, and usually I get between 6 and 8% 8, 8 adoption of the conference. So six and, between 6 to 8% of the in, attendees of these conferences will actually pick up this card that you know, nobody's heard of, nobody knows about, and look at it, and then go to their computer and say, gem install Ruby Nation. And immediately I get a, a ping to my server and says, so-and-so installed this. And I've gotten some, uh, some famous names from some very big companies to install these gems, uh, surprisingly. It's always, <laughs> it's always cool when I get some of the other speakers to install it. <laughs> yes. Uh, don't worry, I didn't do this today. You guys don't have anything to worry about. But this is, uh, this is an example of how I can convince people to install my gems without having to get up here and give a talk, and without people knowing that it's me who wrote this gem. So what happens now? What if someone actually did this for real? What if you know, I was actually writing malicious code, and I was getting people to install it using those cards, and um, I was owning their gems and carrying on until I got to one of the dependencies of Rails? What would happen? Well, um, once Ruby Gems realized they were compromised, they would probably go down. Heroku deploys would go down, and I would go to the beach. <laughs> this is what happened a few months ago with the YAML vulnerability on rubygems.org. Uh, and let's dig into that a little bit more. So the first thing that happened was Ruby Gems went down, but they only went down for a moment, and then they came back up. And they only kept people from pushing new versions of gems. Uh, if there were actually malicious gems being hosted, you could have still downloaded them and ran malicious code. Um, so it didn't really make sense what they were doing. Um, RubyGems should have stopped downloads as well. 
Heroku went down, and they did a better job. They said, um, you should not be pulling new gems down. You should not be installing new gems. Um, but if you want to, we'll give you a way to do it. But they did not make that the default. Um, they were um, secure by default in this case. They were saying the default thing is we're going to just say you shouldn't download Ruby gems. The other interesting thing from this attack was Ruby gems, after they realized this happened, um, they said, okay, let's stop everything. Let's keep everybody from pushing. And what they did was they said, all right, this is the time that we know that this attack started. And we can assume that before the attack started, all the gems were good. There was no malicious code. And after that, it's kind of up in the air. So they compared gems from before and after the attack to see if they had changed. And that's the way they vetted all their gems to make sure they were good. With the attack that I'm proposing, stealing gem quarter credentials, there's not an individual time when Ruby gems could say, this is the first time Ben stole a gem cutter credential. I'm basically stealing passwords. Who knows when I push the first new malicious gem of some you know, obscure gem. Um, they'd have a much harder time recovering from, from the attack that I'm proposing. So what now? How do we keep this from happening? There, there's actually quite a few things we can do, and I'll, I'll go over some of these. The first gem I, I presented, the awesome Rails Flask messages, this was a gem that posted out to a web service. Uh, and for a gem like that, you can use a simple tool like Little Snitch. And all this does is it monitors your network traffic. So in this case, you can see that iTerm is running my Ruby process, and the Ruby process um, pinged out to this Heroku app, right? And if I see that, then I know, hey, this is actually doing something weird. My B Truthy gem was the one that made file system changes. So it modified your bash profile and alias sudo. For a gem like this, uh, if you use a tool like FS Eventer to monitor file system changes, it will show you that your dot profile was modified and this dot temp file was modified. So what you can do is you fire this thing up, you install your gem, it shows you what happens, and if it's touching things that you don't expect it to, you know, take a look and see what's going on. Another thing you can do is don't install gems from strangers. <laughs> um, and specifically, don't gem install. The be truthy gem exploit was triggered at install time. What you really need to be doing is a gem fetch and a gem unpack. Like I said, if you do a gem install or if you're using Bundler and you type the bundle command, it's going to download and immediately install those gems. If you don't want to install a gem, you need to use gem fetch. Once you fetch the gem, then you can use the gem unpack command to uh, unpack the gem without installing it, and that will give you the actual rail or the actual source tree of that gem before it's installed. Um, and that way, you can expect it. And in the case of the B Truthy gem, you'll see that there's a couple of extra files which were moved or completely deleted at install time. Doing gem install is really the equivalent of going out to the internet and just saying, run this file right away. That's what you're doing every time you do a, a, a gem install. Or maybe this is a better example. Piping some script from the internet to bash. Nobody's done this, right? Everybody's done this. This is how you install all RVM. Um, I've done this. Of course, in these cases, we're choosing to trust rvm.io or fileplanet.com or you know wherever else we're downloading things from. But with RubyGems, you, you have to trust all of rubygems.org. And anyone can push gems to rubygem.org. Even I can push gems. Every time I create a new gem and push it up, I'm always surprised that you know, my credentials haven't been rejected. <laughs> so if we really want to trust rubygems.org, what we should be doing is installing all our gems with dash p high security. This requires signing of all the gems we install. And in theory, this gives us the ability to track back the author of all these gems. So if um, malicious code does get, you know, or if malicious gems do get hosted on Ruby gems, we can at least 
find out, find a real person that created that gem. Of course, this search stuff requires a high level of adoption. Um, does anyone know how far you get if you try this? You basically don't get anywhere. The first dependency isn't, isn't signed. So really what we need to do is be building all our gems with these certs. Um, and signing gems is super simple. It uses a simple public-private key. Um, we have to hope that our private keys don't get compromised the same way that I stole the gem cutter credentials. Um, there's a couple of projects that are trying to beef up the gem signing, but they haven't gotten a whole lot of traction yet. Something else we could do for gems is uh, create sandbox environments to install and test out our gems. Um, you know, some place where you don't have to worry about malicious code running rampant on your system. Another option would be someone could fork Ruby gems and add code to send notifications when new versions of your gems get pushed. At least that way you'd know when someone had stolen your gem cutter credentials and was building and pushing new versions of your gems. Um, I've also heard that you could use Gymnasium to do that. Um, I haven't done that, but I'd like to try. If anyone has, please come talk to me. We could write tools to detect malicious code. Um, and if someone added this to RubyGems, that would be perfect. But this problem gets super hard when you really start thinking about it. Another thing we do is create private gem repos, manually vet every single dependency that we have, and when we know it's good, throw it in our private repo and only install out of that. I've heard that some companies are doing this now. Um, I've also heard of, at least in the States, some government contractors who are really concerned about security do this. They have to go through every line of code from every dependency. Um, and so they do that on these gems and they put them in these private repos and you know that's where they install things from. So we could do all of these things. And some of them are easy, some of them are hard. But the one thing I would like everyone to do is not try this at home. The Ruby community is very kind and very supportive, and let's keep it that way. But maybe take away from this talk the following few things. Don't install gems you don't need to. Favor writing code yourself rather than installing somebody's gems that was suggested on a Stack Overflow post um, to solve some small issue you're having. Pay attention to what your gems do. Um, if it's RSpec matchers, expect them not to have C extensions, for example. Monitor your system. Uh, Little Snitch and FS Eventer are great tools to do this. And of course, read the source. So the last thing I'd like to present, this last gem, and I know none of you will install it. I promise it's not malicious. Um, this gem's called Coal Mine Canary. Um, and I guess way back in the day, um, coal miners used to carry a little cage with a, a, a canary in it. So they'd go into these mines and these workers would um, be carrying this canary around in this cage. And the idea was that these canaries were more susceptible to dangerous gases. And these canaries would literally die if they came up across a pocket of this dangerous gas. And this gem kind of does the same thing. Um, it goes into your environment and sees if your environment is safe. Um, so it tries to do things like post out to a web service or get your gem cutter credentials or grab SSH keys and known hosts. Um, it tries to do all those things. It doesn't actually send me your SSH keys, so don't worry about it. Um, so when you install this thing, it says your results are logged to this kill count file. And if you open that up, it says, uh, oh, it wrote to your bash profile, and it grabbed all your SSH keys, and then you killed all your canaries. So try it out. <laughs> so the last thing I'd like to say is uh, conferences always inspire me. Um, I go to conferences, and I learn about um, new things I want to try, new patterns, new ideas. And I always go home being like, I'm going to you know, try this on my project. I hope this talk did not inspire you to write malicious gems, but I at least hope it was entertaining and eye-opening. Thanks. So, questions, ideas? <laughs>
the fun part of this talk, or the, the part that I enjoy, is that people always come up to me with these crazy ideas afterwards. Oh, you should go and grab uh, Twitter credentials and post out to everyone's Twitter account in the app. Questions? What is your actual job in, at uh, Pivotal? <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> one more time. What was the question? I'm sorry. My job at Pivotal. <laughs> all I do is write these all day. <laughs> uh, I'm a Rails consultant at Pivotal. So um, Pivotal, Pivotal Labs um, main source of revenue is Rails consulting. So day to day, I'm mostly working on Rails apps. Um, we do Agile, we pair full time. Um, and yeah, it's probably about 80% Rails and then 10% mobile and 10% other things like Python and Scala. Um, after all you said, uh, how uh, could you convince us that uh, the last uh, gem uh, <laughs> coal mine canary is, is uh, really evil? How can I convince you guys that the coal mine canary is, is a real and non-malicious gem? I would say I can't. And you guys should all do a gem fetch and gem unpack and read the source and see if it's malicious or not. <laughs> Other questions? I've got one. Do you yeah. think it's, it's doable to, I mean, to check everything, all the dependencies? And, well, keep in mind that uh, it's changing all the time, new versions coming on. So, I mean, you, you've heard people, uh, some people are doing that. Do you think it's doable, really? So, about I mean, che new... checking the source code, doing uh, fetch, uh, gem fetch, and fe um, gem unpack, and, and read the source code for, every single dependency, <laughs> especially <laughs> with Rails, for instance. I, I don't think that it's, it's very sustainable, right? Um, yeah. I actually think that there's a potential for a, a whole service that just does that, yeah. like a whole company, that that's all they do. Um, and you know, you know, us as Rails developers, we pay them you know, X number of dollars per, per month to pull that down. Because you know, I know from my standpoint, I'm installing gems, I'm looking at new gems to use, and I definitely don't have the time to you know, deliver working software as well as read every line of source code. Um, but it's something, something to think about, something to consider. But do you think you, you can find the funding for such a service? I mean? Uh, I don't know. I, I, would, I, would, I would guess that yeah, you could find yeah, okay. funding. I mean, if you could charge you know, companies $50 a month to mm -hmm provide a private repo that you say, all of these versions are good, and like the latest version, maybe you don't have the latest version in this private repo, but you have you know, the version that was released two months ago. I think that would be you know, a big peace of mind for all of these developers that says, like, these things are good, I know if I install from here, everything's gonna be fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Quick, uh, quick comment. Uh, I've heard that uh, Code Climate is, has just begun to do some kind of uh, security checks on source code. So yeah, so I, I've it might be a good idea to to I've, use it. It's free for open source projects, and you can check the source and differences between versions. And so I've heard that as well. And I'm spacing on the name of the library that they use to do the security checks. Um, most of the things that they're checking for are focused around you know things where um, you're allowing SQL injection, um, things like that. Whereas this is like pretty tricky and malicious code, right? There's I don't know, an infinite number of patterns you could use to inject malicious code into your Ruby app. But um, I mean, that's, that's another great service that like, if they could you know, expand it out to beyond SQL injection, beyond cross-site scripting and that type of thing into the space of like, if someone's actually malicious, um, that would be awesome. Right. Yeah, yeah, so Code Climate, like, is CI for security issues. So, you know, it will actually show your build as red as, um, you know, things come up. Yeah. Uh, hey, Ben, thanks for that talk. That was really mm -hmm. fun. Um, I used to work in the security industry. Uh, then I saw the light and became a developer. Um, but, but one of the things I wanted to check in on was, um, do you recommend that your clients get uh, external web pen tests 
uh, penetration tests by um, security consultants um, um, as, a, as, a, as a matter of course? We, we don't, not, not um, in the majority of the apps that we work on. Um, I'd love to have a conversation about you afterwards with the, so, about so, that because pen testing on like web apps is like incredibly interesting. But so, so what uh, 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 F F F F Fabian was just suggesting, right? Mm -hmm. Was um, that's that sort of service is offered, I think, by professional security consultants. There, it's not clear how much value they're actually bringing, but it's another layer, if you like. Um, so it's, it's, it's worth looking into. And I think that the, the, the gem that um, uh, Code Climate possibly uses is called Breakman. Yeah, I think it could be. But yeah. we've got a question here, if you don't mind. Yeah, it's not really a question. Uh, I wanted to mention Breakman, and uh, it's a really a great tool, but it will only scan your final code. Um, mm -hmm. There's a story there. I'm working at, at Gymnasium, and we're yeah. doing some R&D around that. <laughs> And we are working on some tools to uh, scan automatically the gems for security issues. And Excellent. the main issue we have uh, regarding your presentation is that some of the gems have security issues after they are being installed. And for instance, some of them are using generators and you can't detect a security issue and unless you have installed the gem and run the generator. Ah, interesting. <laughs> so we have to so that's a, a great way to obfuscate some malicious code, put that's it in the generator. Really to achieve, yeah, maybe. <laughs> that's excellent. <laughs> Thanks. Thank uh, okay, uh, and on the evil side, um, I mean, there's something eviler to do. I, I don't believe any static analysis uh, is possible on Ruby because. It's, hard. it's too dynamic, and and probably the most interesting evil gems will be evil gems that do evil by concert. So installing a single evil gem, nothing. You have to kind of install two of them. Sure. Uh, and yeah. so when you analyze a single gem, you see nothing. It will evolve something from the other guy that will inject them. <laughs> so and uh, the, I, yep. I don't think that theoretically on a, a dynamic language, uh, such a dynamic language uh, as Ruby, there is any kind of defense in code, so you can defend the code by code, because anyway, you can rewrite kernel and, you know, and do yep. whatever you want. Uh, and so probably it's, it's a, a social defense uh, more than a code defense, so maybe, you know, more karma uh, to the gems, kind of, uh, uh, hey, these very serious people have seen this uh, specific version of the gem and thought that it was safe. Right, more kind right. of uh, even signing doesn't work because uh, as I mean you just stole the SSH keys so we can sign everything also so yep yeah it's a hard problem it's a hard problem to solve okay so this is it thank you once again thank yeah. you. Yeah.